Hello, I'm Dr. Wegdan Rashad, and you are listening to the Psychopharmacology Institute podcast. We are an educational platform that is passionate to help you, the mental health clinician, stay up to date and sharp on the latest in psychopharm. Join me every two weeks where we learn about interesting and clinically relevant topics that you can apply right away in your practice. Before we get started, why don't you go to piupdates.com to sign up on our website, earn CMEs and receive regular Psychopharm nuggets of joy. PI stands for Psychopharmacology Institute, by the way. So go for it. So how often do you prescribe monoamine oxidase inhibitors or MAOIs? Personally, I've been doing a bit of research on it and asking colleagues, and I found a lot of hesitancy among clinicians to use MAOIs. Why is that? MAOIs have been around since the 1950s when it was fortuitously discovered that one of the early MAOIs, ipronizid, actually had antidepressant properties. Since then, our understanding of the pharmacology of MAOIs has advanced considerably, but unfortunately, the use of these agents has waned in recent decades, often due to lack of education about the importance of these agents and their unique effectiveness properties. That was Dr. Jonathan Meyer, who's a clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of California, San Diego. He presented an excellent CME video lecture on our website on a guide to the modern use of MAOIs. I suggest you check it out. Links are in the transcript. Anyhow, so just like Dr. Meyer stated, the education we might get in our psychiatry training programs is oftentimes insufficient when it comes to using MAOIs. Other factors I've found may explain this hesitancy is that most doctors are unsure about the dietary restrictions and the drug interactions as well. MAOIs can be used for major depressive disorder, and there are other uses too. Take it away, Dr. Meyer. One thing we learned from the NIMH STAR-D study is that less than 50% of unipolar depression patients achieve remission in monotherapy trials of the usual agents, SSRIs, SNRIs, mirtazapine, or bupropion, often necessitating the consideration of antidepressant combinations, augmentation options, and eventually further on down the algorithm, irreversible non-selective MAOIs. These agents thus offer a therapeutic opportunity for patients who do not respond to single or dual mechanism strategies or the usual augmentation strategies. Moreover, Non-selective MAOIs have compelling effectiveness data for other conditions, including panic disorder and social phobia. Although these agents are among the most effective treatments for unipolar major depression, they are often underutilized because of an inadequate understanding of risk mechanisms and resultant fear of catastrophic outcomes. So there are also avenues for using it for panic disorder and social phobia. Also, I'm sure you've heard of selegiline, which is an FDA-approved agent for Parkinson's disease. The patch form of selegiline is called MSEM, is also approved for depression. Important to our understanding of MAOIs is their mechanism of action. It was known in the 50s that monoamine oxidase existed, but it wasn't until the early 70s that the two isoforms were differentiated by their preferred substrates. MAOA is widely distributed both in the central nervous system as well as in the gut, which plays an important part of its risk issues. The preferred substrates for MAOA include serotonin and norepinephrine, as well as to a lesser extent dopamine, and also the naturally occurring amine tyramine. Thus, it is important for the antidepressant effects of NAMAOI to inhibit MAOA. MAOB is located in the brain as well as in platelets, and its preferred substrates are dopamine and phenylethylamine. Phenylethylamine is a naturally occurring compound found in foods such as chocolate, and the in vitro pharmacology is similar to amphetamine, but there's one important difference. The half-life after oral ingestion is 5 to 10 minutes, and therefore it has no appreciable CNS impact. Okay, so to recap, MAOA is responsible for mainly breaking down serotonin and norepinephrine, and MAOB mainly breaks down dopamine. There is an agent which is used for both Parkinson's disease and major depression, which is called selegiline. 
The problem is selegiline in oral form generates very low levels and primarily inhibits MAOB. Because of this reason, a transdermal form of selegiline was developed, which gives much greater systemic exposure and also less GI MAOA exposure as well. Because of the higher levels of MAO inhibition, which can be achievable with transdermal selegiline, it was approved for the treatment of major depression. Because transdermal selegiline is not orally administered, at the low doses, you actually avoid significant MAO inhibition in the gut. So no dietary warnings exist for the lowest dose, which is 6 milligrams per 24 hours. Although as you get to higher dosages, there are dietary warnings that do exist. So low-dose selegiline primarily inhibits MAOB. At higher levels, it loses its selectivity and so acting on many other neurotransmitters. Other MAOIs you should know about include isocarboxazid, phenylzine, tranylcypramine, and rasagiline. All of them are irreversible, non-selective MAO inhibitors. Well, except for rasagiline, which is a MAOB inhibitor. Now, what's the deal with the dietary restrictions with MAO inhibitors? Dr. Meyer nicely described it as a fear of catastrophic outcomes. Is it really all that catastrophic, though? Clinicians who are familiar with MAOIs recognize that there are dietary restrictions to minimize patients' exposure to tyramine. As many know, significant tyramine ingestion may cause an increase in blood pressure in people taking an MAOI but many overestimate the prevalence of foods which are high in tyramine content since the early original reports emerged of this interaction in the early 1960s. In a recent monograph, one of the leading experts on MAOIs, Professor Ken Gilman of Australia, stated, and I quote, Very few foods now contain problematically high tyramine levels, and that is a result of great changes in international food production methods and hygiene regulations. Cheese is the only food that, in the past, has been associated with documented fatalities resulting from hypertension. Nowadays, most cheeses are quite safe, and even mature cheeses are usually safe in healthy-sized portions. So tyramine is this biogenic amine found in fermented or decayed food. When we eat fermented food, our gut MAOA enzyme breaks it down. When we take an MAOI medication, Tyramine builds up, and so we have tyramine rascals running around in our system. Let's talk numbers, though. Brace yourself. The one exception, as mentioned previously, is transdermal selegiline, as appreciable gut MAO inhibition does not occur until doses greater than 6 milligrams per 24 hours are reached. In fact, this was studied, and no significant pressor response was seen in participants who were on selegiline transdermal 6 milligrams for 24 hours for two weeks who consumed a meal that provided 400 milligrams of tyramine. Again, remember, most people in a meal rarely consume more than 25 milligrams, but they purposely gave these people on transdermal selegiline 6 milligrams a whopping dose of 400 milligrams of tyramine. Conversely, for oral agents that produce gut MAO inhibition, Tyramine doses as low as 8 to 10 milligrams may increase systolic blood pressure by about 30 milligrams of mercury. These dietary warnings do not apply to resagiline, which is a selective MAOB inhibitor. So for transdermal selegiline, gut MAO inhibition occurs at doses above 6 milligrams. For oral MAOIs, tyramine doses up to 10 milligrams can raise blood pressure by 30 millimeters of mercury. Now, How do we bring all this information together and communicate it to our patients? After the break. When discussing with patients safety issues related to diet, here are a few important concepts to remember. In an era when the tyramine content of foods was much higher, the early 60s, and often unregulated, and MAOI users received no dietary guidance, Only 14 deaths were reported among an estimated 1.5 million patients who took MAOIs. As mentioned previously, MAOIs do not raise blood pressure, and their use is associated with orthostasis in some patients. Hospital evaluation is needed only if a substantial amount of tyramine is ingested, estimated greater than 100 milligrams, and self-monitoring shows a systolic blood pressure greater than 220 over a prolonged period, for example, two hours. All patients who are prescribed an MAOI 
should also purchase a portable blood pressure cuff for those rare instances when a dietary indiscretion may have occurred and the person experiences a headache within one to two hours after the ingestion. Most reactions are self-limited and resolve over two to four hours. So in summary, it's advised that our patients have a blood pressure cuff handy. Ingestion of 100 milligrams of tyramine would almost certainly have to be intentional as it would require one to consume three and a half ounces of the most highly tyramine-laden cheeses. For most people, a standard amount of cheese ingestion is maybe one ounce. So one needs to emphasize to patients that only a small number of highly aged cheeses, foods, and sauces contain high quantities of tyramine and that even these foods can still be enjoyed in small amounts. What other foods contain high tyramine? Other than aged cheese, and by aged, we're talking cheese older than six months here. Aged sausages, marmite, sauerkraut, and kimchi all have higher than average levels of tyramine. Interestingly, it's a myth that wine is high in tyramine. Its tyramine content is actually pretty low. So that was the food instructions. What other things should we keep in mind? Patients who ingest 100 milligrams of tyramine or more should be evaluated by a physician. Under no circumstances should a patient ever be given a prescription for nifedipine or other medicines that can abruptly lower blood pressure because this may result in complications, including myocardial infarction. Instead, patients should be counseled to remain calm. This is a very important point. And how to manage that, I wonder? Some clinicians endorse the use of low doses of benzodiazepines, for example, the equivalent of alprazolam 0.5 milligrams, to facilitate patients relaxing because anxiety elevates blood pressure. A recent emergency room study of patients with an initial systolic blood pressure greater than or equal to 160 or a diastolic pressure greater than or equal to 100 without end organ damage demonstrated that alprazolam, 0.5 milligrams, was as effective as an ACE inhibitor in lowering blood pressure. Of course, the prescription for alprazolam has to be limited to those who do not have a history of substance abuse. The point being is that anxiety, more so than tyramine ingestion, is often the reason the blood pressure is elevated. Getting patients to relax, possibly with the use of a low-dose benzodiazepine, can often avert an unnecessary trip to the emergency room. There you go. This is an option. But of course, the caveat is to assess whether using a benzo would be wise, considering your patient's history. So dietary restrictions are one of the big hurdles in MAOI therapy. The second is related to drug-drug interactions associated. Let's explore serotonin syndrome. So the risk for serotonin syndrome is not exclusive to SSRIs. There are many medications that act as promoters of serotonergic activity, including the antihistamine chlorpheniramine. We provide you a table here of commonly used agents, many of which are familiar to you. For example, the tricyclic antidepressants all inhibit to one degree or another serotonin reuptake. Of course, SSRIs do this. All SNRIs are designed to inhibit both serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake. The antipsychotic zeprazidone is also an SNRI. There are cold products such as dextromethorphan and chlorpheniramine, which also have serotonin reuptake. And there are synthetic analgesics such as mepiridine, fentanyl, and tramadol, which have serotonin reuptake. What about antipsychotics? Can we combine them safely with MAOIs? Most atypical antipsychotics are also serotonin 2A antagonists and can be combined with MAOIs, for example, to try to augment them in unipolar major depression. However, as mentioned previously, ciprazidone is one exception. It is a moderate SNRI, and despite the fact that it has the serotonin 2A properties, there is at least one case report of symptoms consistent with serotonin syndrome in a patient who has administered an MAOI together with zeprazidone. I will digress a little bit with Dr. Meyer about the clinical hallmarks of serotonin syndrome, but bear with me. There's a very nice nugget for you in there. 
In addition to the medication history, the clinical hallmark of serotonin syndrome that helps distinguish it from other related disorders, such as NMS or neuroleptic malignant syndrome, is that clonus and delirium develop very early in serotonin syndrome, and clonus eventually becomes spontaneous and sustained as the severity increases. Clonus is not a hallmark of NMS, and this alone, along with the medication history, can help people decide what is the clinical scenario when patients are on multiple psychotropic agents. So mental note, clonus and delirium are an early feature of serotonin syndrome. There's also another drug-drug interaction you should know about. Do you have any idea? Here's a clue. It's about blood pressure. The key point is that as a class, MALIs tend to lower blood pressure and have a risk of hypotension, not hypertension. Use of amphetamines is theoretically concerning due to their agonist actions at both the norepinephrine transporter as an inhibitor, as well as at TAR1. A 2004 review did not find cases of hypertensive crises when combined with MALIs, nor did a recent paper describing the combined use of illicit dexamphetamine, or Vyvanse, and transdermal selegiline. Nonetheless, if a stimulant is needed, the preferred agent is methylphenidate. Methylphenidate only inhibits dopamine reuptake, does not inhibit serotonin reuptake, and therefore has no risk for hypertension or serotonin syndrome when combined with MAOIs. So if your patient is taking an MAOI and needs a stimulant too, it's better to use methylphenidate. We are nearing the end of this episode. We have covered the basics of MAOIs, tyramine, and informing patients about it. We've also covered the drug-drug interactions associated with MAOIs. My goal today was to help you get informed and comfortable with MAOIs. And once you feel well-equipped, we can go to the next steps and learn about how to actually prescribe it. Join me in the next few episodes as we learn further about MAOIs. Now, in case you snoozed, here are the key points. The monoamine oxidase enzyme A, MAOA, is primarily responsible for breaking down serotonin and norepinephrine, and MAOB mainly breaks down dopamine. Selegiline, available in transdermal patch, is an MAOB inhibitor at low levels, and is FDA approved for both depression and Parkinson's disease. Foods particularly high in tyramine include aged cheese, aged sausages, marmite, sauerkraut, and kimchi. Practice caution when combining MAOIs with SSRIs, SNRIs, chlorpheniramine, synthetic analgesics, and ziprosidone. MAOIs tend to cause orthostasis rather than hypertension. If you want to use concomitant stimulants, though, use methylphenidate to avoid serotonin syndrome and pressor reactions. Did you know that a lot of today's content was extracted from our CME presentation entitled Modern Use of MAOIs? Check it out on our website. Visit piupdates.com and become a premium member already. We have a bunch of CMEs for you to collect. If you're a psychiatrist in the US, we also offer SA credits. You can also go on our website and join our newsletter to receive weekly updates delivered straight to your inbox. The following people participated in this episode. Dr. Flavia Guzman as a general editor, Andy Rode as audio engineer, Pamela Gonzalez as a project manager, and myself, Dr. Egdan Rashad as the host. We'd also like to thank Dr. Jonathan Meyer for being with us. Thank you for joining us in today's podcast. Until the next episode, goodbye.